Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and uh, we got a special audio interview for everyone today. Uh, we're going to be interviewing uh, Ted Butler here on the program, uh, one of the most respected, sought-after uh, commentators in the precious metals community. Uh, his website is butlerresearch.com, uh, and we're going to really get into it here uh, when it comes to what is going on with gold and silver, a lot of people are frustrated with it. They don't even care that we're at uh, $1,300 plus gold uh, because we've been here a couple times already. And uh, the expectation is for it to just fall back below once again and for it to disappoint as we've seen uh, for the last couple years here, uh, even off the bottom of the December 2015 low. Uh, but let's discuss this in more detail. Ted Butler, thanks for coming on Crush the Street with me. That, thanks for having me, Kenneth. So uh, I'd like to start off here. I mean, I don't think there would be anything more exciting uh, for the investment community that I'm part of than a rip-roaring bull market in precious metals. I mean, it's the it would line up with the narrative of you know this out of control monetary policy. Uh, you know, it's a precious metal, hard asset, you know, fiat currency problem, hedge against inflation. I mean, everything lines up. And, you know, I, I could even tell even with the rise we've seen with gold that there has been some enthusiasm, but it's been very difficult for people to believe it because we have been here a couple times uh, since 2016. So uh, I'd like to just start our conversation here. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, well, I happen to, you know, agree with with everything that you just said, namely that uh, for some reason, uh, gold and silver have not been able to make uh, any real headway uh, to the upside, despite conditions that would normally tell us that, uh, that we should be much higher. We should be flying in price, and it's... Uh, it's the fact that the, the price hasn't moved that, uh, you know, people just become conditioned. They extrapolate that and uh, feel that it, it's never going to move. So we're, we're, people do it in everything. They, they form opinions based upon uh, what the price has done um, without generally looking too far below the surface to, to, to really try and discover why hasn't the price um, of gold and silver, why haven't they gone up? Well, um, yes, absolutely. And that's something I know you cover in great detail. Um, but I guess even a small degree of upside would be better than nothing. I mean, we've just seen um, the opposite narrative take place on what you know many thought should have happened, which is... Uh, a declining fiat dollar, uh, you know, the stock market not going to all time highs, and at least gold acting uh, respectable in relation to that over the last few years. I mean, obviously, you can take it back many years, and obviously, gold's done what it's done, and it's been a great hedge against inflation and retained its purchasing power. But since 2011, it's obviously been uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of ups and downs and, you know, downs really. So uh, yeah, let's, you know, touch on that a little more and touch on what you're seeing specifically in what is controlling this price and how long they can keep this going on for. Uh, well, that, that's the, uh, you know, the, the, the key point. I, I'm a firm believer that the, the price of uh, gold and silver, along with other commodities uh, increasingly, commodities as diverse as uh, crude oil, copper, corn, uh, you name it, um, they, they've all become, but certainly gold and silver, they, they've all become captive to the derivatives market. The, uh, specifically in the case of, of gold and silver, the COMEX futures market has become such a dominant force in the uh, in the pricing of gold and silver that you really don't have to look any further than what's going on in 
what you might want to call the paper market, the COMEX futures market, as to why gold and silver prices have done what they've done over the last uh, and any number of years. Um, and, and drilling down into that, getting into what um, constitutes the, the control that, uh, that the, and the price of gold and silver is that uh, we've evolved into a two-party game uh, where one group of traders trading on technical considerations, moving averages, um, algorithms, versus, in the case of gold and silver, the big banks, um, uh, mostly big banks, on, on the other side of the transaction. They're just battling it out in this speculative uh, frenzy. There's not that many of them. There's only maybe 50 or 100 traders on either side of the market. But because they take such large positions in, in gold and silver in terms of numbers of contracts, that they've come to dominate um, the whole pricing structure. It's, it's nothing determines the price except what's going on on the paper market on the COMEX. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's a shame because it's, uh, first of all, it's, a, it's against the law from, from, you know, basic commodity law that excessive speculation should not be setting the price of, uh, of silver or gold or any commodity. Um, yet that's exactly what's taking place. Um, and well, anyway, that's the explanation for why we are where we are, why we've gone flat, okay, in price, say, for the last five or six years, in spite of things that you would normally think would drive the price of gold and silver higher. Um, it hasn't occurred because of this immense, enormous paper trade that's going on in the, on the COMEX. It's, um, it's, it's, it's both the explanation for why prices have done what they've done, but it's also on, on the encouraging optimistic side, it's going to be the reason that prices throw off the shackles of this paper trading and adjust to the upside. I think uh, uh, silver m more than gold, but I, I would think both are going to break the uh, the shackles of this paper suppression as a result of what's going on in the COMEX. So I think there's going to be, you know, happy ending and upside resolution. Um, and we may be on the cusp of that right now. Yeah. Well, uh, I... I'm optimistic for that as well, and I'll reiterate what I said uh, earlier. Um, you know, we, as an investment community, people who uh, know what's inevitable, uh, I mean, nothing would be more exciting than a, a bull market of epic proportions in gold, because we know what is uh, going to happen ultimately. And uh, a rising price will be, you know, great validation. And I, I think for those invested correctly, um, a wealth transfer, uh, a game changer for those prepared according, or accordingly. So uh, all very positive. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, how much do you attribute the, the doldrums that we've seen in gold uh, since basically the Trump election to a certain degree uh, following, you know, camp the election day of 2016, uh, to, to the optimism that is in the U.S. economy uh, based on Trump. I know, you know, we can critique Trump for different reasons, but to a certain degree, there has been a lot of optimism. And, you know, he, for, I, I, you know, I'm not even going to get into the nuances of it, but I just want to ask you, what are the, how much can we attribute uh, the lackluster, uh, fear trade being subsided because Trump was elected in uh, 2016. Well, uh, you're asking me directly, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer you directly. I, I don't think that uh, it's had any uh, 
basic impact on it. Uh, if, if you go back to uh, uh, before uh, Trump even came on the scene, if you go back to uh, you know uh, years before that, it, we 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 peaked out in in uh, gold and silver in <clears throat> 2011. So I'd be hard pressed to. Uh, uh, to put the, uh, the the onus or the you know the, the blame or the credit for um, the current prices on on Trump, but again, that's you know that's one man's opinion. It's my opinion. I, I thought you were going to ask me something different. I, I would have a much different answer if you asked me um, who uh, or what entity has had the most impact on um, gold and silver, um, uh, I would say, you know, without hesitation, J.P. Morgan. Not, not the long dead uh, financier that, that passed away a century ago, but the, uh, the current uh, incarnation of, uh, of the name in, in the form of the uh, largest U.S. bank, uh, J.P. Morgan. Um, I, I would say, almost single-handedly that J.P. Morgan is more responsible for current gold and silver prices than any other factor by such a wide measure that, uh, that there really is not, nobody, no entity in second place. It's all, it's all J.P. Morgan. Right. Uh, yeah, no, and there's been a lot of evidence on that. Um, so what, what's the, what's the fascination? Uh, this is a softball, uh, and I know we've discussed this, but I want to get your thoughts on it, but what's the fascination with JP Morgan, uh, having this major interest in, uh, suppressing the price of gold and silver? I mean, is it just them wanting to be profitable or is there something deeper that people, uh, should be aware of? Well, that, that's a, you'd get a, a, a lot of different, um, you know, responses to that. Again, if you're asking me, I'll, I'll give you my response. I mean, anything is possible, I suppose. But considering that, that J.P. Morgan is a very much a for-profit organization, um, you'd naturally assume that every every endeavor that they uh, get into in a big way is, is, is for that reason, is to, is to make a profit. So I, I'm not a, a deep conspiracy guy, so I'm going to, um, you know, uh, it, it appears to me that whatever J.P. Morgan does, it does, it, it does for the benefit, the financial benefit of the organization, and I can't see why it would be any different for gold and silver. So. To answer your question specifically, though, like um, perhaps why has uh, J.P. Morgan single-handedly, as I allege, um, depressed and suppressed the price of uh, gold and silver over the last decade? I think it started back in uh, your precise point in March of 2008 when J.P. Morgan took over and acquired the uh, failing investment bank, Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns happened to be, uh, at that time, um, the largest uh, gold and silver short seller on the COMEX. And by taking over, uh, JP, taking over Bear Stearns, J.P. Morgan inherited that, um, that mantle of being the largest single short seller in gold and silver. And I, I, for the next couple of years, from 2008 through um, the end of uh, 2010, J.P. Morgan was very content to play the, 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 the wash and repeat, uh, rinse and repeat game on the COMEX of uh, flushing out technical funds and making paper profits and, and a good amount at that. Um, until the price ran up in silver in, in 2011 to, to nearly $50, and uh, J.P. Morgan was short at the time, and I think they uh, they, they looked into the abyss and, and saw that this was not the place to be. They were out 
uh, several, uh, billion, several billion dollars as a result of being short silver. And they decided then and there, they're a, a resourceful lot, and uh, they decided then and there that uh, the way to immunize themselves from uh, being caught short in, in a future rising uh, metals market, they did uh, something that I never anticipated they would do, but they did it nevertheless, and that was they began a physical accumulation of both silver and gold, and over the years, since uh, 2011 when they started, they've amassed a, a, a just a, a historical um, a physical holding of both silver and gold that most people aren't aware of, but in the case of silver, and it's taken them, um, you know, uh, eight years to to accumulate. They didn't they didn't do it overnight. You just can't blink your eyes and and you know, click your heels and just say I'm going to accumulate uh, many hundreds of millions of ounces of silver and 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 and, and millions of ounces of gold physical gold, you you have to take your time and, and not run the market up. So what they did was it's, it's amazing. They they were they remained the biggest short seller on the COMEX in gold and silver, okay, throughout this whole time. Not right this minute as we speak, but up until very recently they were the largest short seller in the paper side. But the whole purpose for them of uh, being short and depressed the price was and to depress the price was to allow them to buy physical metal on the cheap, buy it as low as they could. So that's the rationale. Sell the paper market short, manipulate the price down, and so that you can buy as much physical metal as you can. And boy, have they bought a lot of physical metal. They've bought, by my calculations, upwards of 850 million ounces of silver that's what we mine throughout the world in a full year and they put as much as 20 to 25 million ounces of gold uh physical gold now, even though um they own much more in terms of ounces um in silver versus gold 850 million versus 20 25 million um, because the price of gold is, is so much higher, that their, their actual uh, expenditure, financial expenditure, they, they spent more on the gold than they have on the silver, but they're just uh, gargantuan quantities in, in any regard. They're the largest, you know, physical holdings by a non-governmental agency in history. And in a nutshell, it puts them in a perfect position to let this thing fly to the upside, gold and silver, okay, more than any other single reason um, that I believe anybody can come up with. And it's, it's virtually unknown. It's, uh, they, you, know, you can't find it on their books. They're smart enough and they have an army of accountants and lawyers and lobbyists that they can hide this thing. It only represents, you know, as, as big as it is, I think it's kind of, they spent something like $50, billion on their uh, uh, total cumulative gold and silver physical purchase. But $50 billion to, to, to JP Morgan is like uh, a dollar or two to the, the average person on the street. It, it represents no more than two percent of their entire uh book of assets their uh, the, the number of assets that they hold which is which is measured in the uh, oh i think at the last i looked it's like a, at least a, a trillion and a half and i might even be i might even be off on that <clears throat> so that's the story and as i see it in, in gold and silver it's been down for certainly for the last eight years flat uh uh, but not up, okay, because J.P. Morgan has been leaning on it because J.P. Morgan was in the business of acquiring as much physical metal as they could because they could see what's coming. And what's so, coming 
is is much higher prices. So that's very interesting, and I wanted to get to that. Um, you mentioned J.P. Morgan basically being spring loaded to the upside with gold and silver. Now, is it going to be a matter of them unleashing it, or for gold and silver to do its own thing? Well, you know, this, this is the most amazing thing of all, Kenneth, is that in order for gold and silver to race towards the heavens price-wise, okay, all J.P. Morgan has to do is absolutely nothing. They don't have to. They, it's, 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 what they have to do is about as easy as falling off a log in the water, okay? It's like they just have to keep their their hands, their greedy little paws in their pockets and not go short aggressively on the next gold and silver rally, which may be starting now, it's possible. Um, they don't have to do anything over. They don't have to take any kind of uh, uh, special action in order to um, cause the price of gold and silver to go, down, uh, go up. All they have to do is stop doing what they have been doing in suppressing the price, which is namely shorting paper market COMEX on every rally that we've seen over the last 10 or 11 years. And it's that shorting by JP Morgan that has prevented uh, gold and silver from going up. The minute they stop, that they go on vacation, they just go fishing, whatever the hell that they want to do instead, as long as they don't add to short positions, there will be no selling pressure. And every idiot technical fund and momentum trader in the world that will chase prices higher because they chase prices higher on everything. Why wouldn't they chase prices higher on gold and silver? If JP Morgan is not there to satisfy that new buying that'll come in, the price of gold and silver will explode, period. Yeah, well, that's powerful. Well, a lot to uh, definitely chew on there. Uh, Ted Butler, everyone, uh, Butler Research. Uh, Ted, if people want to learn more about uh, your website and what you do, uh, please let them know about you know the work you put out. Obviously, uh, the things that we talked about today is a, a great snapshot of the things that you research. Uh, but yeah, if people want to uh, subscribe and, and learn more about what you do, please let them know about it and what they can expect to find. Uh, sure. I, I put out uh, two uh, fairly lengthy uh, articles each week. I just uh, uh, put out one earlier today. I, I make some of the uh, articles public, so you can you can look uh, to get them on Silver Seek or, or different uh, um, you know websites. Uh, if you go to butlerresearch.com, uh, Google it. Um, I, I offer a uh, subscription on a monthly basis, is uh, two two articles per week. And uh, if you really have an intense interest in you know and in, and. In, in, in learning uh, what I think is going on, it's uh, it's worth a try. No uh, no long term commitment, anything like that. It, it, you'll either like it or you won't. Um, but uh, butlerresearch.com. Well, Ted, I appreciate your time here with us at Crush the Street. Uh, thanks so much for coming on and updating us on what's going on in the markets. Thank you, Kenneth. Have a good day.